They are going to have to make some lifestyle changes. They are going to have to make some big mindset changes. But I can tell you that at the end of the day, it is going to be 100% worth it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the How to Sell Insurance podcast. My name is Ryan Federico. I am here with the two baddest men on the planet, Mr. Grant Lieber, who uh, took a brief stint off of crushing the leaderboards to, uh, to grace us with his presence on today's episode. And uh, we got Ashton Delango Lunday, who's also been writing up a storm. I really need to set my game up because I'm just writing these like little four thousand, five thousand dollars, writing you know ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month. And these two gentlemen are out here absolutely demolishing it, and I can't let that happen. So uh, let this be known: the gauntlet's being thrown down. I'm coming back. But hey, check it out. We are going to talk today. We're going to start a series. Actually, it's all about making the transition from being a W two employee to a 1099 business owner and what that can be like. We know it's it's challenging. All three of us have helped coach a lot of people making that transition from W-2 into 1099. And we've learned some stuff along the way. And we found, I think, some of the best strategies that help you make that assimilation. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, it's not an easy assimilation to make. We've been trained for years to just like clock in and clock out and do what our boss says and show up on time and things like that. And sometimes when you're the boss and the employee, you know, things don't work out very well. You can sort of be a lenient boss and you can be an employee that takes advantage of a lenient boss and both people are you. So that, that's kind of crazy. I was uh, giving an example the other day, and, and this is sort of the thought that I, I just wanted to start off with everybody. And then Grant, had a lot to sort of say about how to make this transition and we'll kind of go to him and then we'll go to Ashton's thoughts before we get into some of the tactical things. But I was on an interview. I had uh, eight or 10 people that want to be a part of this business and, and they had all signed up to one of my group interviews. We were going through the group interview and, and something kind of came over me. I asked them, hey, how much more expensive are groceries today than they were a year ago for you. And I was just giving the example of groceries and we went into other expenses in their life, but I said, if you spent a hundred dollars a year ago on groceries, how much is it today? Is it $115 Is it $120? What is it? And you know, how much is electricity and how much is your cell phone bill and how much is cable and how much is medical insurance and car insurance and a car payment and, and all those things. The general consensus around the eight or 10 people was about 15% more that if they were paying $100 for groceries before, they're paying $115. Now, we can debate the reasons why, but this isn't a political podcast. I was just making a point. Things are getting more expensive by 15 20% plus. And so the reality is, if you're in a W-2 job, if you're not increasing your income by 15 or 20% every single year, you're going broke. You are falling behind. Hey, everything else around you is getting more expensive. And when's the last time any of you walked into your boss at the end of the year and was like, I need a 20% raise, right? It doesn't happen. You'd be lucky to get a 2%, maybe a 5% raise, but you're not going to get a 15, 20% raise. So more and more people are waking up to this and they're starting to realize I need to be in control of my income. I need to be the one that's raising myself and earning more money in my own business or in a side hustle or something like that to make sure that I'm outpacing inflation and outpacing how expensive everything is getting. The problem is that most of them have never worked on their own. Most of them have always ever shown up and just, you know, be here at 9 a.m. or you're fired, right? And they've never had to get themselves out of bed. They never had to actually become the boss. They've always been the employee. And so those two things don't mix. So we hope that this series that we're going to be running through here can help everybody make that transition a little bit more seamlessly. So I wanted to uh, kind of introduce and throw it over to Grant Lieber and uh, just kind of get your general thoughts on the on the subject before we go into specifics, man. So what's going on, Grant? Hey, buddy. Good to be here. I uh, appreciate yeah. the invite on uh, with you two uh, distinguished gentlemen, um, even though Ashton's a Cowboys fan. But we'll, we'll give him a break on that because, uh, you know, he definitely knows how to sell insurance. But no, this uh, this topic is something that's very near and dear to me. Um, and really, I think it's important for anyone, not only if you are that new agent yourself that's you know, getting started, making that transition from something that was more of a, a W-2, you know, it was an hourly or salaried position, and now you are moving over to being a business owner. Um, but this also applies to those that are developing agencies and, you know, have people that you're helping navigate through this process. So first of all, I want to give everybody a round of applause if it's your first time making that transition. You know, I, I think the most important thing that people have to look at is the mindset behind your schedule and your commitment. Because in the very beginning, 
you know, you don't get paid based on your skills because you don't really have them yet. You're going to get paid based on your work ethic and your commitment to developing skills. And we've all probably heard kind of that that analogy where they go, you got to go, you got to work, 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 work. And then you see your first deposit and then it goes kind of work, work, deposit, you know, <laughs> work, work, deposit. And then it's work, deposit, deposit, deposit. And early on, you are not going to be paid as well as you will as you're going through the learning curve. That's just a fact of life. When you join a W-2 position and you're, let's say they say you're going to be paid $20 per hour, well, you immediately start at 20 bucks per hour. The problem is there's really not a whole lot of wiggle room to, to move a whole lot higher than that, at least not in any quick amount of time. When you're self-employed, you're starting at zero, but you can immediately jump to hundreds of dollars an hour day one. But the problem is most people don't treat it with the level of intentionality that it requires. And so I think what we really wanted to talk about is not only the mindset behind it, but also, you know, we'll get into some technical skills and things so that you actually can look at yourself and have kind of a scorecard to say, hey, am I really treating this with the level of intentionality? Am I really being as serious about this as I should be? And uh, I think the main thing coming in is understanding that you need to have a commitment to ongoing self-improvement in a way that you've never had to do it before. When you think about on the job training, it's kind of like, you know, I worked at Albertsons when I was 16. You know, there wasn't any prep work. I didn't have to study late at night to figure out how to push shopping carts around or how to mop the floors or how to box <laughs> groceries. But when I got there, they had that person kind of walking me around, showing me where this is, showing me where that is, you know, teaching me here's the route when you got to sweep the store every hour. Um, and so in, in our job in our role here as being a business owner, being self-employed, you know, you don't have that location where it's, hey, this is an on the job training. So you really have to treat everything that you're doing as an opportunity to grow. And I remember when I very first started, you know, making my car a rolling university was pivotal, pivotal to my success. I had an audio for a uh, phone training, presentation training. You know, when I came to more on the leadership side as I built my agency, I always had something kind of queued up, you know, before an appointment, after an appointment, you know, and even when it wasn't a work day, it could be the weekend and I would just be outside, you know, listening to something or, or anyway. So my point being, man, is I'm really excited to go over a lot of this stuff. But I think the biggest thing for people to, to, to kind of look at it um, is know that they are going to have to make some lifestyle changes. They are going to have to make some big mindset changes. But I can tell you that at the end of the day, it is going to be 100% worth it. Dude, I, I think there's so much to unpack there, man. Like one of the things that was saying to me when you were talking is like, okay, do you want to make less when you're bad and more when you're good, right? Or the same whether you're good or bad. And a lot of people would say, oh, I'd rather make the same whether I'm good or bad, right? It's that safety mindset. I'm going to have this guaranteed income, you know, or whatever it is. The problem with that is that you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow your income. You're going to get the same whether you're good or great, no matter how much impact you're making on the company, no matter if you work you know, 80 hours or if you work 60 hours or if you work 40 hours, if you go over and above, if you're the best at what you do, it doesn't matter. You're capped. You're going to make the same amount. And when you commit to, I'm going to make less when I suck and more when I'm good, the reality is the time when you suck is short. And the time when you're good at this is really long and you make way more money than you would make if you took that the same if I was bad or if I was good. And so a lot of people, I think they look at it from a, a fear standpoint of, well, I'm going to suck forever and I'm going to I'm going to be really bad for a really long time. And I've never seen that in, in most businesses, and especially in our business. I've seen, you know, people that commit and actually do the work, they only suck for a short period of time, right? And then if we, they're making enough money that then they just start getting better and better and better and better. I think we all have a ton of examples. I guess I would encourage everybody who's listening to this right now, if you're thinking about, I'm going to start a business, I'm going to become a 1099, I'm going to get into the insurance business, which is, you know, a lot of you guys are listening to this right now. Think about anybody in your life that you know that started a business, whoever it is, uncle, cousin, friend. Doesn't matter what kind of business. They started a restaurant, they're a plumber, they do hair, they have a t-shirt company, whatever. Just think about what it was like for that person starting that business and what they had to do to get that business off the ground. I, I have a cousin who's a very successful plumber, but he wasn't a very successful plumber when he started. He worked as a plumber <laughs> on somebody else's plumbing team and then started doing some side jobs and then branched out on his own. It was like, I'm starting my own shop had to buy all his own equipment, had to get his own licenses and certifications and bonds and, you know, liability insurance and like all that stuff. 
then had to go out and find the clients and do the work. And guess what? He bought the wrong material and clients didn't pay him. And there was mistakes on jobs and the city took forever for permits. And all of the same challenges exist. If you're a restaurant owner, right? Like you're going to have uh, employees call out sick and steal money from you and days that your POS system doesn't work and deliveries and food that goes bad. Like this is kind of what starting a business is. And, and think about now the people that you know in your life that have been running their own business successfully for a long time, like what's their life like today? So if you're willing to go through that short period of time of learning and not being great at it, the payoff, exactly like Grant said, is so much higher than if you would have just, you know, got a $70,000 a year base salary job. It's unreal. But uh, Ashton, you came, I'm actually super excited to hear this because a lot of people don't know this. Ashton came into this, you know, uh, he had been working at good old Sonny's Barbecue. Uh, shout out Sonny's Barbecue. I have uh, some fond memories of Sonny's Barbecue in Florida, but was uh, was a server at Sonny's Barbecue. Uh, I was in seminary had a tragedy in his family and he was affected by an insurance payout and was like, all right, I'm going to start this business. And Grant, did you come in from outside sales when you came into this industry? No, sir. Delivered flowers and uh, worked for a nonprofit. Got it. So yeah, it'd be good. To, it'd be interesting to hear your experience on this too, because I came in from commission only into this industry. So Ashton, you're coming into this industry and you shot out of a cannon. You did what I think most people that come into this industry would hope that they could do could make a seamless, quick transition from hourly to, you know, making a bunch of money in commissions and being their own boss and sort of managing their own schedule. What was that like, man, for you? Yeah. I think making sure that you, you have those, those standards in place is going to be the the biggest thing. And, and that first one has to be discipline. Uh, right. It doesn't matter if you're trying to do this part-time, full-time, spare time, you know, whatever you want to call it. If you don't have your discipline put in place, then it's going to be hard. If you don't discipline yourself to to learn, if you don't discipline yourself to memorize a script, you know, sometimes that's, that's some of the hardest things that we try to do. And, and for some reason it's hard and no really know why, but we sit down and go, man, I, I can't memorize something that's two pages. I think the greatest, greatest example is the story of an instructor who, who did clay. He had two classes and he, and he gave one of the classes an assignment. He said, Hey, by the end of the semester, I just want one perfect clay pot. That's it. Just end the semester, your whole, whole semester pass fail. I just need one perfect clay pot, one, one clay pot without blood. The other class, he said, Hey, listen, I need as many clay pots as possible you will be graded solely off of how many clay pots you can produce by the end of the semester. At the end of the semester, the section that had to make as many as possible had more pots without blemish and had a higher quality of pots than every other student that only had to focus on one pot. And the, the lesson there is just very simply, if we focus on putting in the work, if we focus on doing the quantity Quantity will always beat out skill, beat out getting lucky once. If we sit there and we consistently put in the reps, we consistently make the phone calls, consistently book appointments, we're going to have more success than if we sit there and just try to get the one perfect presentation. Oh, I, I got to study the script and until I have it perfect, then I'll go do the one presentation. If you just sit there and go do it every time and do it multiple, multiple times, then you'll be able to to have that result. And that's the same conversation I had with an agent yesterday who said, Hey, I want to get your ad. I, I mean, I, I got to get there. And I was like, listen, to do what I just did last week, I had to book 23 appointments. How long do you want to take to book 23 appointments? Do you want what I'm doing in a day? Do you want it in a, in a week, a, a month, a year? How long do you want to wait to book 23 appointments on your calendar? Whether it takes a month, a week, whatever, however long. You can't get to where I'm at until you've done at least that. Like it's impossible to make the same amount of sales on two right. appointments. So that's simple. Well, I do. I listen. This is a perfect transition because, like, the the topic of this episode that we sort of all got together and wanted to talk about was having standards. And yeah. it's a little bit different than setting goals. You know, goals are what you'd really like to have happen. Commitments are what are, is going to happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. And standards is what's going to happen consistently no matter what. That's that's a standard, right? And what you accept. Uh, yeah, what, what you, you accept. accept. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think that 
why is this important? Why have we spent, you know, 16 minutes introing this topic? Because 90% of this, if not 95% of this is mental, right? This is just a mental block of you clearing out, like Grant said, a commitment to ongoing self-improvement, clearing out the beliefs that you've been taught of, you know, I, I do the bare minimum and I skate by. And I, I think a lot of this, Grant, is really innate, man. Like I remember I brought somebody in one time and they were just having a real tough time doing work. They're like, that's, that's the bottom line. They were having a really tough time working. They couldn't figure out how to get 10 hours of client contacts, like outbound client contacts into their schedule. They just could not do it. They couldn't bring themselves to do it. And so I started flushing this out with her and I was like, so when you had that job, uh, how far did you drive? And it was like, oh, it was like 40 minutes. Okay, so so 40 minutes both way. D what time did you have to get up, you know, to go to work? You had to be there at nine. What time did you have to get? Oh, I had to get up at seven, the shower and eat breakfast and uh, do all the stuff I needed to do and get in the car and get, you know, get in traffic and go to work. What time did you get home? Uh, you know, I got home probably around like six, you know, somewhere in there. Okay, so, you know, can we agree that you were, allocating and you were actually giving from about 8 a.m. till about 6 p.m. to your job, including travel time and like maybe even a little bit earlier, maybe like 7.30 a.m. because you're getting ready and, you know, getting dressed and stuff like that to get to work. Were you ever answering emails after work hours? Yeah. Were you ever taking work phone calls on the weekends? Yeah. Okay. So, what are we talking about here? Like you're actually working 12 hours a day, right? It's not a 40 hour work week, but for whatever reason, you can't seem to put 10 hours in when it's your own business. And what's the disconnect there? They're paying you $70,000 a year. We've got people in our company making $70,000 a month. I and mean, there's agencies making $70,000 a day and you can't figure out how to put 10 hours in. And so what is that disconnect? And it's 90% mental. And so, that's why we're spending so long talking about this, but standards, having a standard is easily what I think propels the, the highest performers to perform. Now, your team already might have standards. Whoever you're working with, your mentor, whatever environment you're in, there might be some pretty consistent standards already set. We have some pretty consistent standards within our organization. That's 15 appointments on your calendar every week. You need about 300 outbound client contacts for that. That's, you know, about the standards that this is what we do. If you're full-time, we have 15 appointments on our calendar at all times. And that's, that's the standard level throughout our organization. That's why our organization is so successful, really, because everybody's committing to that. Now, people come in, though, and they get two or three appointments, and then they stop. Right. They, oh, I got to figure out how to sell these appointments. I got to, you know, I got to research. I got to call the insurance carrier and they, they stop. Or, or I was guilty of this too. Like, oh, I'm going to I said 11 and yeah, that's good enough. I could probably make it on 11, right? I'm going to kick it the rest of the weekend or whatever. I'm not going to finish the 15. And so what did you have to do, Grant? Because you're probably the most consistent person I know at setting double digit appointments on your calendar every single week. Like there had to have been some switch that you flipped to go like, if I don't have 15, I'm not stopping. And that's a standard, yeah. right? Yeah. I think it really just, it, it starts with looking back now, it's easy to pinpoint what makes someone have success versus failure. And it always boils down to one of the, the four keys to successful week. Was it resources? Was it schedule? Was it activity? Or was it a lack of uh, plugging into the system and, and using kind of your resources in the process? So when I look at kind of like I look back to, to, to maybe earlier on in my journey, I didn't really understand why we preach booking 15 appointments because I kind of thought, hey, I could book 11 or I'd have a really good day where maybe I booked nine appointments in like two hours. And I was like, you know what, maybe I'm going to sleep in a little bit tomorrow and then maybe I'll, you know, not really get a, have my foot on the gas like I normally would. And then you look back and you go, those are always the weeks where I shot myself in the foot. I started so strong. And, and what you have to understand is that you're either in a situation where you owe the numbers or the numbers owe you. And so when the numbers owe you, that's probably a period of time where you might be in what some people call it a slump. OK, a slump is nothing more than the numbers owe you as long as you've been you've been consistent. And so when you're you're in that numbers OU mode, you know, you have to keep the faith and keep doing the activity until they come through. But then the most dangerous part is when the numbers are coming through for you and, and everything is kind of working in the way that you think almost too well. 
people let their foot off the gas because they assume it's always going to go that way. I was actually watching um, Mark Cuban. He was talking about when someone comes on Shirk, um, you know, they get a big spike in sales as a result of them being on national TV and, and people seeing the product. And people take that spike and think that it's going to last forever. But what happens quickly is that they, those sales drop back down to where they were, and now they need to, to go back to growing it organically. And so when it comes to this business, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you have to keep a level of consistency because you're going to have a one week that's awesome. It's like you're walking on water and nothing can go wrong. You're writing policies. People are showing up. Life is good. You know, somebody's cousin called you and randomly said, can I spend 300 bucks a month on life insurance? You're like, sure you can. Then you're going to have the week where it's like nothing can go right. Nobody wants to answer. The person that you talked to 30 minutes ago to book the appointment now suddenly ghosts you. You know, policies are getting declined. Someone from six months ago says, eh, you know, we don't really want this anymore. Like the chicken little, the sky is falling. And then you're going to have two weeks in between that where it's very like kind of consistent, you know, like it's kind of average of those two. And so what's so important about booking double digit appointments is so it creates a situation where over the course of the whole month, we're going to have the good, we're going to have the bad, and we're going to have the average, but it always makes it consistent if you stay with a certain level of activity, with a certain level of resources, with a certain level of committing to, to your craft. So when I look at, at the significance now of doing something like booking 15 appointments in a week, it's because I know that on average, I would have about 10 people that I would actually have a presentation with. And if you sit with 10 and you're a brand new agent, you're never going to help less than three out of 10. I've never seen on average somebody have a lower than a 30% close ratio. And then once you get past the learning curve and you develop your skill set, you're going to be more like a five to seven out of 10 that you're going to be able to, to write a policy on. And so now when I look at how I'm able to not only consistently write business every week, but consistently write 10K plus every week, it's just because I've raised my standard from booking 15 and sitting with 10 people. Now my standard is, is booking roughly 22 to 25 appointments, sitting with around 15, and then writing at least 10 plus applications. So when we talk about standards, if you raise or lower your standards, that's going to dictate what you are willing to accept and what you will get. God, I remember, and you were so much closer to this than we were just because of your agency, Lee Jed Lika writing $10,000 a week for like two years straight. Or yep. something like that, like 112 weeks or 115 weeks or something like that, where it was just 10 K a week. And everybody was just like, oh my God, like the guy walks on water, you know, or whatever. And, and really he just has really high standards for himself. You see that throughout his life. You see that in his commitment to fitness. You see that in his commitment to his other businesses, in his commitment to language. And honestly, in his commitment to our country, you know, being a, an immigrant that came from another country and committing to becoming a United States citizen, which congratulations, Lee. Uh, on becoming a, a full citizen. I know the process isn't easy in our uh, in our country, but that commitment level cascaded into how he approached this business. And just like you said, oh man, if I got to set 15 appointments, I've got a language barrier. I don't have experience in this. You know, I, I should probably set 30 and I'm just going to double it. And I'm just going to commit to setting 30 no matter what, because I got to do twice as much as everybody else in order to get the same results. And then he ended up just getting double the results of everybody else, right? <laughs> which was which was amazing. So I, I thought about that a lot, what that commitment level will get you uh, when you decide to commit to a set of standards. Man, it must have been a trip seeing that on your end. Yeah, and I would just kind of round that out with saying like, that is one very popular strategy to get more is to do more. So if you're someone who, you know, sits with 10 people and you are only writing kind of those those minimum three, but your goal is to write six policies a week. Well, the, the immediate answer is I get double the leads, I make double the activity, and I book double the appointments. And keep in mind that you only have to do that for a season. You do that for a season because during that period, you're also going to develop your skill set so that you don't have to do double. Kind of like with Lee, started out with a scenario where he has to do two or three X more activity than other people to get the same result. But as he develops his skill set, now it translates into him actually getting two to three X the result. Totally. Totally. I want to talk about another element that I think is super important to this and it's competition. Now, some people are competitive by nature. Ashton is one of the most competitive people I think I've met. Uh, there's a lot of competitive people and maybe that's, that's uh, I don't mean that in a negative way, Ashton. I mean that you, you have this drive to want to perform and want to be the best at everything that you do. And it's this natural competition that that goes on. And I've seen that from day one with you. 
but like being in a competitive environment, it can be really beneficial for you know people who want to, I guess, adopt standards because a lot of times the people that are in that competition are are adopting standards. Uh, the problem that I see that happens so often, and this happens in our agencies a lot, is you get the people that are making this transition to adopting standards or making this transition from W two to ten ninety nine. They're not having a good go of it, right? They're they're in that struggle period. They're in the suck. And instead of latching on to the people that are producing and crushing it and doing great, they latch on to the other people that are sucking. And it's like crabs in a barrel pulling each other down, right? And it's like you're 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 getting advice from people that are not getting the results that ultimately you want to get. And you're commiserating and you, you know, misery loves company and is like, oh, this sucks and these leads and blah, like all this. And then you're gone. You're out of the business. And so you latched on really quickly to the people that were performing at the highest level. And I don't remember you ever talking to anybody who was like not producing at the level that you wanted to produce at. Then you just came out crushing and swinging like if these people can do it, I can do it. What was that like, man? And and like how much did competition play a role in, in your success starting? In the very, very beginning, there wasn't a lot with competition probably in in the first month or so at least. It was more of just, you know, having that discipline like, like we talked about before of, hey, here's this new thing. We have to sit down and and learn everything we can to get to where we need to be and having that unwavering focus and discipline toward that goal. Then probably after uh, the first month or two, then being able to go, all right, there's now this success within this. What are the things that are possible? You didn't even have a goal. You were like aiming for people who are at the top of the leaderboards and you're like, I'm going to get these fools. And you were like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be up there. I mean, you were telling Griff, you were just like, watch out. I'm going to make it happen. So yeah. like, I know you're very competitive by nature, but like yeah. you weren't going to the people that were writing 5,000 and go like, oh, I'm going to compete with them. You were like, I'm going to write 35,000. I'm going to, I'm going to blow yeah. all these fools out of the water. Yeah. And that, that really changed. Like I said, after that first month, once I sat down and figured out this, I got to where I had the, the focus, I had everything I needed. And then I said, all right, now one, I, I've seen this this business, this industry, it, it's, it's real. One, I can do it. But then two, here are the things that can be possible. You know, what, what can we do now? And then making sure not to miss a, a promotion. I, I didn't miss a promotion in my first eight months. I, you know, I had a 20% raise in eight months. I, I didn't miss a single promotion. And, and making sure to go hit those goals and those those benchmarks and go, all right, what, what is possible? How, how can I be at the absolute top of this and get to the next level each and every time. And that drove a lot of, of what I did in that beginning. And when you have that, it, it helps. Yeah. I think those, again, we talked about like, does your, does your agency, does your company already have built in standards and built in goals for you? And that's one of the things that I really love about our company is that it does. We have very clear built in goals, especially when you're a new agent with our slingshot bonus, where we're just like, Here's your goal for month one. Here's your goal for month two. Here's your goal for month three, right? And it's very easy to just adopt that and go, okay, this is what I'm going to do this month. This is how much effort it's going to take. Here, I'm going to make this number of dials. I'm going to make this number of contacts. I'm going to set this number of appointments. I'm going to buy this many leads. It's going to result in this many sales. And I think that the rest is just execution, is actually getting in and doing the work and not falling prey uh, to what has happened to so many people making that transition along the way where they revise their goals. And so if there's something that we can end on, um, I learned very early on in my entrepreneur journey, in my journey as a 1099, that every time that I set a goal and then I didn't commit to it, I made an agreement with myself that it was okay to give up. It was okay to not do what I said I was going to do. It was all right for me to go back on the commitment that I made to myself or to my family or something like that. Whenever I said I was going to set 15 appointments and I set 10. When I said I was going to write five applications and I wrote three. Whatever, whatever it is, I made a mental agreement with myself that it was okay to not do what I committed to do. And that's a very dangerous path. And so how do we reverse that? Well, we start off with small little goals. And those small little goals might be for you. I'm going to wake up 15 minutes earlier. 
and you know I'm gonna go for a walk in the morning. It might be you know I'm gonna read ten pages a day and actually doing it. It might be that you are gonna commit to do and not stopping until you hit your three hundred dials or not stop working until you hit your fifteen appointments. Whatever it is, like now you become a person who fulfills his or her commitments. Yeah, and, I, and I'm so sorry to cut you off there, but you just said something that really triggered this kind of thought is, you know, first of all, it really starts with, and, and I know we're talking to people who are already committed, right? So that's that's kind of step one is you got to be committed to what you want to do. Then after you decide that you're committed, you have to decide that you're willing to do the things that it takes to get what you want. So once you know what you want and you learn how to get it, so in our business, for example, you know, we have certain things, you know, time, money, freedom, travel, relationships, Okay, those are things that pretty much everybody wants, right? But after you've decided that you wanted them, now you have to decide, am I actually going to, am I willing to take the action required to get what I want? Because wanting something and then being willing to do the work to get what you want, that's a very big gap. That's basically, in a nutshell, is the gap between people that are homeless and billionaires. It is the difference between people that take action to actually get the things that they want. And so the good news about following a proven process is it's not guesswork about how to get what you want. You just have to follow the path. But in, you know, when you're in a, on a sports team, you know, you've got a dugout you can go into. You have guys that encourage you. You have guys that build you up. You have people that you can connect to. You know, when you're alone dialing, you know, you got the four walls around you and it can be a lonely business. And so that's why setting the standards, plugging into the system and being around people that are a positive influence are going to get you there a lot faster. Man, 100%. I hope you got some value out of this because we've been dropping nuggets left and right. And if you, if you didn't get any value out of this, good luck succeeding. I'm just kidding. You know, it's just, you know, well, hopefully you will on some of our other episodes. Uh, but keep checking back. Uh, we're going to keep dropping new content for you guys uh, every week, popping out new episodes and uh, have some new guests on and whatnot. Our, uh, we're going to keep dropping videos in this series of what it takes to transition from W2 to 1099. Uh, and we will keep uh, keep on bringing value to you guys as much as we can. Later, everybody. We'll see you.